Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to this talk uh, called Framework Compass Chart. Um, Framework Compass Chart is a tool that we developed develop in Flowing that we use to um, help teams to choose their, the tools and the frameworks that they have to use in their project. Before we start, let me introduce myself. I am Francesco. My real name is uh, Strax, is my code name. Is uh, something more than my code name. I think that just my mother, my father, and my girlfriend call me Francesco. Um, all the other people that I know call me Strats. You can follow me on Twitter if you want. I have my direct messages are open. So if you have any question, you can just follow me on Twitter. I will try to answer when I have time. And uh, I work at Flowing. Flowing is a, a, a software company based in Italy, but we are a remote first company, so we are scattered around Italy, and we. Uh, we work in an, inclusive, in an inclusive way with our clients, so we try to develop our software uh, with the help of our clients. So let's start, and let's start with the concept of JavaScript fatigue. JavaScript fatigue is a concept that uh, I learned about it, I think, a couple of years ago, in a, in a post, in a blog post on Medium, that it was a funny post about a guy that uh, try to run or understand what is happening in the JavaScript community and if I want to make a short version of this post, I just say that there are frameworks everywhere in JavaScript. And it's true, um, we have new tools, new buzzwords every six months whatsoever. We have Angular, we have Vue, but we also have buzzwords about architecture, we have for example, reactive programming, we have Redux. Now we have, for example, micro frontends. It's a new buzzword in the frontend community about creating smaller, smaller frontends with different frameworks glued together with web components. So it's a kind of mess out there, okay? But in my opinion, there is also another way to see this scenario. I really like this Twitter from Sean Thomas Larkin. He is one of the main maintainers of Webpack. And this says that this is not just fatigue, it's just renaissance. Uh, my point is that I, I like to see this scenario as an opportunity, more, uh, more than a problem. As a front-end developer today, I have a lot of way to solve the same problem. So I I'm happy because I can choose what kind of solution I want to implement every time. But I think that behind every opportunity, there is a challenge. And the challenge that I face today as a front-end developer is to choose the right framework. If I just had a React, it would be easy to choose the framework. But the point is that when I have Angular, React, Vue, and they are very, very different way to develop a front-end application. What is the right framework for my next project? Um, I think that we need to change our focus here. This is a, one of the, one of the points of the Agile Manifesto, and it says that in the reader and directions over processes and tools. So I will change my previous slide with this one, and I say that I would like to choose a good enough framework in a right way. This is quite different because I'm focusing on the process of choosing the framework more on more of the result itself until you know. Okay, you don't have to choose jQuery, but sometimes jQuery is a good enough solution for your problem. Okay, the point is, okay, I would like to choose a good enough framework in a right way, but how can I do that? It's not so easy. Uh, but I think that we can manage something. Uh, usually people, the, the, the first group of people just use the hype. They just use the last tool available out there. Um, they use something in uh, alpha version or, if you're lucky, beta versions, okay? Then you have 
workers. You had people that hate the last framework that they used and they want to change. Everything else is good, it's better than the old framework. Uh, I'm not joking. If you, a lot of people, some years ago, just don't want to work with AngularJS anymore. Never. Uh, there was no discussion with them. Or you can just ask the expert. You have in your company, you have uh, the CTO, you have your software, architect, engineer, blah, blah, blah. And you ask him, they, what is the right framework to choose? Like, like they know. They probably don't know better than you. So, the point is that I will not talk about code today. I will talk about decision making. This is a, a completely different kind of topic. And I also about uncomfortable to talk about it. I, I really love code. It's, uh, it's easy to show code on the slide. It's not so easy to talk about decision making. So, what kind of problem is to choose a framework? Uh, I found this, um, the next slides are taken from this book called Thinkers Toolkit. It's a, talk about, it's a book about decision making, it's a very, very cool book. But let's try to categorize the problems and to choose what kind of problem is to choose a framework. The first set of problem is simplistic. There is only one answer. For example, who is the president of the USA? Donald Trump. We don't need to discuss about that. We can discuss, if you want, why he is the president of the USA, but not who he is. It's Donald Trump. End of discussion. They are the easy problems. Slightly more complicated one, deterministic. There is only one solution, not only one answer, sorry, but you need some kind of analysis or formula to find it. The area of the circle. If you know the formula, you automatically know the answer. And again, we don't need to discuss about that. Let's go on with random problems. I think the things are getting harder now. There are more than one answer, but you can list them. You can list all the possible solutions, but there is more than one correct answer. Which of the candidates will win the election? This could be a very, very complicated matter. In Italy, it's more complicated than ever, in my opinion, but it's another, that is not the point of the talk. But I can list all the possible options. Last one, indeterminate. There are a lot of answers possible, but I cannot list all of them because of their range and complexity. Try to answer this one. This is a very, very complex matter. I can list all the way of the internet affect my retail sales. It's impossible. Lucky for us, to choose a framework is a random problem. But before we go on, I want to focus on this chart. In, uh, for the first two kind of problem, simplistic and deterministic, the role of that data is maximum. On the other hand, the role of judgment is none, almost none, because we know the answer or we know the formula. Going from deterministic to indeterminate, these two kind of role switch. So for indeterminate problem, the role of judgment is really, really important, and the role of data is not so much important. Of course, if you, uh, for example, you work with machine learning, every, uh, every, every person that works with machine learning, they will say that data is important. But just because we want to give the machine some kind of judgment. Not because the data are important by itself. In the machine learning, the data are important to get automatic judgment. So, random problem, is a mix of data and judgment. Okay, this is the first point. I can understand what kind of judgment I have to think about, but what data do we need? 
What data do we need to analyze to choose a framework? Okay, when we develop the software, we usually have a list of functional requirements. If you are lucky, you have user stories, uh, or you can have that beautiful functional requirements book from the bank, or something else. For example, this is a user story. As a user, I want to log in so that I can access the member section. Now, I want to twist a bit this user story with something else. As a user, I want to log in so that I can access the member section in less than two seconds. Now think about it. What of the two version of this user story it's more useful to choose a framework? The first one just say that I want to do the login. The second one let's say that I have to do the login in less than two seconds. Probably this part it's way more important than the, 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 the story itself to choose a tool, to choose an architecture choose the right team for the project. So, um, we need to shift our focus from what the software should do to how a software should be. And how can we do that? We can do that with non-functional requirements. There is an entire new list of requirements that we need to develop good software. Quoting Wikipedia, a non-functional requirement is a requirement that specifies criteria that can be used to judge the operation of a system rather than specific behavior. We don't explain what the software had to do, we explain how the software should work when doing the stuff. This is a non-comprehensive list of non-functional requirements. You have a lot of stuff like performances, resilience, recoverability, evolvability, uh, usability, testability. In some books, they are called ELTIS. It's an English book, of course, because they, every, everything ends with ELT, so they are called ELTIS. But that's the truth. This is just a part of the list that you can find on Wikipedia, and there are also some really good books about that. Um, for example, there is a book called Building Evolutionary Architectures. This is a book from some people from Tufts, but I can't remember the name, but it's a very, very good book. Uh, it talks a lot about non-functional requirement. Okay, so we know that we need uh, our functional requirement, of course, but we also need this stuff to choose a framework. And, and this is why we need develop this framework compass chart. Framework compass chart is a tool that helps visualize the most important non-functional requirement of your project. Okay, first important step. People involved are tech people and stakeholders. With stakeholders, I mean everyone. I mean from the CEO, CTO, or users if you can, everyone. And I know that it, it could be a very, very interesting meeting if you put everyone in the same room to choose about the next framework to use in the project. So you have to use the right words, okay? you have to work your way around it, but it's very, very important to bring these people together. What you have to do is to take the list or to take another list and choose five and non-functional requirements, the most important ones. Okay, again, how? How can I choose five non-functional requirements for my project? One of the exercises you can do is a retrospective. You can do a retrospective with the same team but on a previous project. What in your last project works out well, works out so and so, or works out bad? From that you can take a lot of useful information about what you don't want anymore in your project. Okay, you say that you don't want AngularJS any anymore, but why? What was the problem of Angular? Are you sure that the same problem will not be present in React? 
oh, it was your problem, but okay, this is not, okay, it's a difficult question to ask. Another very, very interesting tool to break, to get out on functional requirement is the SWOT analysis. SWOT analysis is, a, is, a, is this kind of tool where you put the strengths of your organization, of your product, of your team, their weakness, then this is the internal origin, this is an internal focus, then you have also the OT, opportunities and threats of the external one. If you put, if you populate this stuff with post-its, you have a lot of thing, interesting things that you can transform in non-functional requirement. For example, if on threats you have competitors, you can work out something that will bring, that will go against the competitors. One of our clients decided to put on the non-functional requirement list the wow effect. The wow effect was something very important for them, but it's something that you can't describe with a functional requirement. It's something that you, it's a way to define how your software should be, not how what it should do. So you populate these charts with post-it, and from them you can extract a lot of useful data. This is a very, very sim simple exercise that you can do with your team. It's called trade-off slider. You have all your team together, tech people and also stakeholders, and order these four items without same level, okay? This is very, very, very interesting. Because if you have a project where budget is the first thing, then you have quality, then scope, and then you have deadline, now and you have to choose a framework. Now imagine that you have a completely opposite list, doing the same stuff, but with the opposite list, probably you can't choose the same framework as before. This simple list gives to you a lot of interesting information about how to actually put that software in motion. Okay, if I have deadline at first, probably I have to choose the framework that I know the most. If I have deadline at last, probably it means that I need, I can invest some time in choosing the right technology. Okay. Now that your team found the five most important non-functional requirements, put them on a radar chart. Just uh, a side note, these are real data from a real use, use case with the client. So we have testability, evolvability, performances, we have community. This is the community of the framework that we have to choose. And this is very interesting because a manager choose to put the community in the chart. Then I will, I, will explain, I will explain to you later why. And then we have velocity. Okay, now fill the chart. All together, not just the tech people. This is the chart. So we say that testability is quite important, like availability. We don't really care about performances, for example. It's an important thing but it's way, way less important than evolvability or community. And then you have velocity. This is quite strange. When I, listen, when I look at this chart, I feel something that was not good. Because how can a manager say that community is way more important than velocity? Okay, okay but there is, there is a catch. There is a catch, and this is why this tool is working, because it made this thing out so that people can talk about it, and I will explain to you in a second. Now that you fill the chart, you can use this as a compass when choosing the framework. Okay, now your tech team can decide, say, okay, we would like to use React, and then you try with your team to fill the same chart with the React values. And you can sample, you can add something like this. Then you can do the same thing with Angular, or you can do the same thing with some kind of backbend framework or language, or whatever you want, and you see how it maps your context. 
Because this is a, it's a kind of map that lets you understand where your software is living. It's living in a context where evolvability is more important than velocity, for example. This is a very, very important topic. This tool will not give you the solution, but it will help you to have a better discussion. This is more important because remember that we need to choose a good enough framework in a right way. Like I said before, I don't care too much about the final decision. I care about that everyone is looking at the right point when they are making the decision. Remember, sometimes people, they really, really want to make a war about it. They really want to, we want to react to it because AngularJS is so old, it's so 2000, 2010. But they are not talking about solving the problem. <clears throat> okay, let me explain some rules when you are trying to fill this chart together. The first one is that you don't, don't give the max to every functional requirement. The, per the perfect solution does not exist. So you can't just give five to everything. Not just because the perfect solution does not exist, but because if you look at this chart, the real value in this chart is not in the single values, but in the difference between them. This is the most important part of this chart. With this, with this part, with this difference, we talk with the manager, we say, why did you say that community was so important? It's more important than velocity. It's strange. What are you not telling us? The point was that the CEO talked with the CTO and said, we can't have, we can't get new people on board. So, for every new people, you have to take a freelance. So you need to choose the framework that the community is using more, because I need to find freelance in a fast way. But the point is that nobody knows that simple fact. So how they choose the framework? Easily, they just, they were in, uh, in uh, near Vicenza, and I opened Facebook and I said, okay, let's take a look at the meetup. Let's take a look at the meetup in the local community. Okay, what they are talking about? React. Okay, this is your framework. Don't look for anything else because your managers said that to you. Then you can, you can say, okay, React gives a lot of performances. Okay, but I don't care. React is testable. Oh, good enough. React is also easy to evolve, so why not? And they choose React. Another rule is that you have to try to reach consensus. You have to work like a planning poker. Okay, so everyone give a number from one to five, and then the lowest and highest need to talk about it, trying to reach consensus. Um, of course, if, if the thing's going, it's going on for a while, you just, uh, just get out. But try to reach consensus, try to invest some time in it. Another useful thing is that you have to use it as information radiator. Print it out, put it on the wall. Not because it's important to see the chart itself, because it's important to remember the discussions behind it. If you are in a remote team, for example, and you have a Trello board for your user story, put that on Trello, put that on Slack. Find a way to use it as information radiator. Okay, I'm not saying that this stuff is to really solve the framework problem. Okay. Because it's uh, this, this, um, this exercise is just a part of a more complex workshop that sometimes we do with our clients. Well, in this workshop that lasts a day, perhaps two, it depends, we need to answer these four questions. Identity. Who are we? Who is our team? What is our product, our mission, our vision? Market. Who are the users? What they want? Value. What the software should do. How can we bring value to the users? What is the impact that I want to achieve with, with my software? And last, 
And this is where we put this exercise, the context, how the software should be. What is around my software that influences my decisions? When you answer all these four questions, it's the only way to take mindful decisions. Do not, do not, don't follow the hype. Just answer these four questions. You don't have to do a dedicated workshop about them. But be sure that your team knows the answers to these four questions. This is the only way to make mindful decisions also if you are tech, in, tech, uh, in tech decisions. Okay, talk to finish, but I want to, to share with you something. Uh, I'm writing a book. This is a, one of the first times that I show this uh, the cover. And it was what, what, quite an impo important moment when they sent me the cover. I almost finished the book. This book is the, is the, what can I say, the extract of the workshop from Amas Coberta that I distilled in, one, in a 2,000 page book. 200 page book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not the Lord of the Rings. And uh, this talk, the book, the Amas Coberta workshop, they are all part of the framework class movement. Uh, that there is something that is all, something that is working also out of Italy. We have some, we have some people in Poland, in uh, UK, that is talking about that, is preparing uh, material about that. Uh, why this talk is important from the framework class movement? Because, okay, imagine that I can explain to you how to create a framework frameworkless application from scratch, without anything. If you had a problem before about frameworks, now you have a bigger problem, because you have React, Angular, Vue, and nothing. So the point is that I need, I need also need to people to think about decision making if they want to take mindful decision. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Beer. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> in English or in Italian? Questions? As you, like. I, um, as you want. Uh, let's do in English. Uh, is um, don't use a framework sometimes the right choice in your? Uh, it depends. Uh, is is oh, of course is uh, related with your books and your. Yeah. Um, okay. It is a good solution sometimes. But it's not a black or white solution. What I mean is that you can choose what are the, in, uh, the core part of the project, and then you say, okay, for the core part, I want control. For example, um, a year ago, last year, yes, I made a consultancy for a React project. It was a very, very slow project. It was a very bad performances, and it was a uh, a progressive web app, and this was a news, uh, newspaper, a digital newspaper. And they have very, very slow performances on the scroll of the list, okay? But they have something like uh, 10 frames per second. It was really, really slow. And the point was that they really, they, they was really bad with React, but really, really, really bad. But, and they know it, and they say, okay, I don't care if you want to do the login with React, but the core part of your application, just focus for two days with me and let's do this stuff from scratch. Because it's the core part of the project. You can do the settings with whatever framework you want, I don't care, but please try to own the code of, the, of your core part. This is, this is an approach. Another approach is, uh, for example, uh, another client so for another client, we create a, a web application for lawyers to manage you know, the, their stuff. And it was a porting of uh, a desktop application built in the 90s, you know, that kind of stuff with Fox Pro desktop application, yeah. And it was a porting in, the, in, a, in a web solution. We started this project six, six years ago. And when we started, we chose to use AngularJS because it was the, the only solution of there at the moment, and because we need to go really, really fast, because for them, it was an experiment. 
So we need to go to the market as fast as possible. Now the point is that two years ago, they said to us, okay, very good. Our company is alive because of the web project. It's the only thing that we sell right now. And then we want to, this software should last another 20 years. Okay. And Angular 2 was already exited. So we had a very, very old framework. And we said, okay, stay calm. How can we manage to make this stuff to live for 20 years? The only thing that you can do is to not use any tool. Because any tool can become stale before the language itself. So what we did at the time was say, okay, the, the software is not so complex about rendering or about state management. We can manage it without frameworks. And we are doing the porting with web components, for example. There, there are use cases when it's useful to do that. Thank you. Any question? <laughs> <laughs>